Good. Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. It is another epi of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you guys as we're still kind of ebb and flowing in the lull in between worlds. Asian Games, LEC has given us just some morsels of food, two games a week, barely keeping our starvation for games at bay. We're so close to the time that you can just go full in to the previews, the predictions for an event like Worlds. Just not there yet, but we're going to cling in to some of these LEC, some new champion details to talk about, and of course the Asian games, plenty to still discuss. It's still weeks away, but look, I, I can't wait anymore. I want to go through, obviously, the two big hitters, powerhouses at this year's Asian games. Team Korea is doing their press conference media circuit, and Team China, obviously, the two big boys heading into this event, and you absolutely already saw in that press conference for the LCK how much pride and the word responsibility was thrown around multiple times be uh, between all the players in representing South Korea as a nation and their country. It's, I mean, it is kind of, it's like the Olympics. There's more pride in this than even winning a world championship. There is that pride. There is that focus. There is that extra incentive for these players. We've talked about it before. These Asian games considered to the same type of level as the Olympic games, you get yourself an Olympic gold medal, you've got yourself a ticket out of that mandatory military service in South Korea. That's exactly a lot of these players will be looking for that opportunity to gain themselves that type of ticket. A gold medal at these Asian games, that type of pride having Korea on top is a big part of it because we will remind you, last time around, Korea didn't end up on top. It was China coming through and taking that trophy. And Korea were, I'm pretty sure, pretty big favorites heading into that. They played in the group stages and played in the best ofs as well. But both obviously absolutely terrifying. But which squad should be favorites? Which is more terrifying to look at? We're going roll by roll here because... I mean, there's advantages. You go to both sides. If we start in the top lane, it's Zeus versus Bin. Guys who are no strangers to matching up on an international stage. Even though Zeus leveled up a little bit during playoffs, you still got to be siding with Bin, even though BLG lost two straight series to close things out, right? I think so. And, I, you know, this is one of those tough ones where... You know, if you checked in a couple of weeks earlier, you're probably rolling even more so with Bin, given what was the state for someone like Zeus, who still had his struggles, not nearly to the degree that a lot of, you know, kind of other members of that T1 roster did when Faker wasn't in the lineup. He really did have that resurgence throughout that playoff run, though, for T1 that does make you feel better about this matchup. All that said, it is still looking on the side of Bin. You're looking at the performances that he laid down at MSI all the way through being that, you know, a mega option in that top side for BLG. You'd be rolling with him in this one in the Asian games. And both of these squads already have some built-in inherent synergy. Obviously, you got three T1 members on the LCK side of things, two JDG members, and the LPL side, you got potentially... I think we both assume Jun should be getting the majority of the starts over JJ, and then you immediately have that Bin and Jun synergy, which was absolutely lethal in their 16 and 1 regular season. So, problem is, Jun matched up against Kanavi. These are the top two seeds from the LPL. I mean, Kanavi, we haven't seen on a star studded, well, I mean, JDG is a star studded roster, but this is all star <laughs> of all stars. This is the trickiest one in this whole lineup for me. It, it's tough because you feel like a player like Kanavi, you know, obviously in the situation with JDG, he kind of ends up taking more of a backseat because of the threats that are already there and getting them online and letting them take over. But you look at a roster that is going to be here for Team Korea in this type of event and the threats that can be there, the aggression that can be there, a player like Kanavi can be the perfect facilitator, the perfect accelerant. For a squad like that, that is what you'd be scared of if you are Team China looking on that one on the other side because Jun, absolutely, he's great. And he does bring in that built-in synergy with a player like Bin, which is going to be a major bonus to unlocking that potential 
for Ben, trying to support him and get him better. The question is going to be, does that translate to everybody else? Does that come at a cost for these other lanes when you're thinking about what potential is going to be there for Kanavi operating between the laners that are, are, that are there for Team Korea? No question, both these guys have some serious pocket picks when it comes to carry junglers, whether it's the Kindred in Italy for Jeanne or that Belveth we've seen be so lethal for Kanavi. Mid lane's got to be the most intriguing matchup. Number one, because now we've seen Faker looks relatively healthy playing all these games for T1. So now the questions really do arise. Who plays more games, Faker or Chovy? And then the other side, you say... Knight, you might have to beat Chovy and Faker in a best of five. Oh, it's exactly what you dream of when you think about these type of potential mega matchups. This is the mid lane of dreams, having any type of option of Faker or Chovy and then Knight on the other side. This is what we have dreamed of so many times thinking about this type of matchup. And on the Korean side, it is a little bit thinking about what type of advantage do you want? Of course, Faker comes in. We know and especially have seen this year that shot calling capability, that uh, you know knowledge that he has for the game is a major bonus, even for players that we view to have that skill, have that potential to take it to the next level. Faker unlocks that for this team. He's also got a little bit of that global taunt going on. Everybody putting all that attention, energy, focus, abilities, into trying to take down the unkillable Demon King. The rest of the squad cleans it up. Tovi, on the other hand, brings that lane dominance to the force, to that factor. And having that up against Knight, that would be quite a matchup. And that is the blessing and curse of having both these guys on this roster is they do bring two very different things to a lineup. Obviously, it's going to depend on what this roster needs more of. If there is a shot calling macro struggle without Faker in the lineup, maybe he starts over Chovy, even though I think most people, ourselves included, would say individually right now, Chovy is probably at a higher level than Faker, but all the intangibles that he brings. But either way, Knight is sitting there saying, play them both at once. I don't care. I'll take them all down. I don't need no sub. The scary thing is, if, if, you, if they let Knight get his hands on Syndra, Silas, Ari, he cares. If it's Faker or, nope. or Chovy, that's the type of caliber that Knight is operating at right now. It doesn't matter if you're the GOAT or you're the guy that's trying to be the next GOAT. I'm taking you out either way. When we go to the bot lane, I think this is, this is the one that sways the matchup over to the LCK. Probably the biggest mismatch, number one, because Elk has bodied absolutely everybody in the world, except for Ruler. He matches up against Ruler, and it's just a different beast entirely. He does not look the same level. He has had his number for the entire year. And then you go to the biggest, ooh, question mark on this Team China roster, which is Mako. You saw his form in playoffs. It was not great. And he has to match up against Kyria. Unless Mako levels up, this is far and away the biggest mismatch in this matchup. Yeah, it's, it's going to be really rough when you think about that type of opportunity because what type of power is swinging over for Korea in this instance? Having Ruler back with this squad, back operating with someone like Chovy from the Gen G days type of thing. This is a mega pushover into the side for Korea and what they've got. And yes, it is you know someone fantastic on the side for Team China. But you've had no results against the guy that is going to be there for Team Korea. Absolutely, this is that check mark for the LCK side. You can find ways, arguments, and I'll believe them to take it over, take Bin, take Knight, you know, even Jun. You can find a way to make that argument and find it. You can't down here in the bottom lane. This is absolutely a double check mark again for the LCK. And we gave the LCK an edge 2018 on this Asian Games roster. By the way, Ruler and Faker were both also on that roster. They're here five years later now, still representing for South Korea. Don't be sleeping on Chinese Taipei and Vietnam. We know that they've put together some solid rosters as well. But obviously, South Korea and China are going to be huge favorites as we're still a few weeks away. But can't wait for things to get kicked off at the Asian Games. Don't have to wait nearly as long for the LEC to continue, we get the return of the Wonderkin, Wonderware matching up against BDS. That's got to be 
the marquee matchup in this series because is Wonder just going to be stuck on Orn? Is he just going to sit there and be Mr. Weakside, try and hold his own against Adams Darius? Or is he going to maybe be pulling out some stuff? Is Fnatic going to be confident in this sub guy coming in th- like a week prep time, basically? So many questions, and the only way to get those answers is to see that action out there on the rift is going to be what we learn from this Fnatic and BDS series. Wonder versus Adam in that top side, as you mentioned, is you're going to just play weak side. Adam's one of the scarier guys in the LEC to play weak side into, given just how aggressive, just how much he wants to push that pedal to the metal, get it onto that floor and start moving away to your nexus is what he wants. Can Wonder stand up to that one? I think absolutely. We have seen that at various other points in his career. The question is going to be about that form stepping into this one. And as well, then I'm looking at that communication, how he's communicating with the rest of the squad, because I think that was something that was cleared up with Oscar and with Noah stepping in. That communication seemed to clear up, and that's where you saw players like Razork and Humanoid really flourish and start to look much more like the players that built their names in the first place. Can we get that in this playoff series with Wonder now stepping into the lineup? And we've heard current players from Fnatic analysts as well say that when Reckless was on this lineup, both he and Wonder were kind of stepping back saying, hey, we'll play weak side, you know, we'll let you guys take over. What You can't have two lanes that are doing that. But now with Noah and Trimby, they are the furthest thing from a weak side bot lane. We've seen Razor give them tons of attention. So the recipe, the formula is there for Wonder to just kind of slot in, do his thing, and let the other four members do what's been working for them for an entire split. If we're getting the Wonder that is channeling his inner fancy feet and he's dip, dip, dancing, even on a champion like Gragas up there under the turret and making everyone die, then absolutely this is a mega win for Fnatic. If this is blunder and not wonder, then you've got issues for Fnatic because it is going to go south sideways really fast for a squad like Fnatic with BDS pushing that point pain point. Now we can talk about who are the favorites and who is most likely to advance, but more importantly, what's the better matchup to see against Golden Guardians? Because the loser of this series is your fourth seed for the LEC, which means they'll be the ones playing that BO5 against GG. Oh man, I don't think Adam is ready to face off against the threat that we've got waiting for us in the licorice. That's the most improved player of the year. Hell yeah, that is C9 licorice up there on the top side, roaming for the Golden Guardians. I don't care who it is. I think either way at this point, it will be a very fun, very spirited matchup that we're gonna get between these two to decide who is going through as that fourth seed. Either way, I'm still rolling with the Golden Guardians. You know I gotta be taking my boys. I mean, for memes and trash talk, you probably want BDS because we know that they got some talk. (laughs) But if it's Wonder playing beyond this BDS series, well, that's the king of LEC trash talk. So either way, that is going to be one of the most exciting matchups to kick off the World Championship. Upper side of the bracket, we got G2 Mad Lions, which have been developing a little bit of a rivalry of their own. We haven't seen them play since week one of the summer split, like regular season. They didn't have any best of matchups uh, throughout the playoff run because Mad Lions disappointed early, obviously. But now we're getting a long awaited rematch from those spring finals. And we'll see if this Mad Lions post break level up was just a fluke against XL or if they can actually give G2 some competition. And and the way that I look at these two lining up against each other is that it's going to be a test and it's a test for both of them. And the question is, well, well, who's being tested, right? Well, on the G2 side, it's yike because you're going up against El Yoya, someone that has been pushing that pace, pushing that level of play from a European jungler for the last couple of years. And yike has absolutely stepped up to that level, possibly even surpassed it in the and then also delivered it consistently for a rookie to do that mind-blowing type of stuff now let's see it in this big playoff type of matchup where el yoya and the rest of the mad lions have been leveling up have been looking better and that's where then i look at the test for the mad lions is going to be everybody not named el yoya and how you approach how you step up in this series are you up to the task to take on the rest of these big members of g2 can you handle caps claps mr niski because we know 
occasionally you've dialed it up before and you've had his number. So it's possible for this Mad Lion side. You look down at the bottom line. Can you get it? Can you hang with the Dravens, with Hansama doing all that damage? That's what I got to see from these Mad Lions. And probably the most pivotal matchup is actually that top side because you saw Broken Blade in the finals, the G2 won. He carried, he had an incredible level. He carried that momentum and had one of his best series on G2 in that BDS matchup. So he's maybe in his finest form. And on the Mad Lions side, I feel like we've been underwhelmed the last few months by Chasey for a guy who was so dominant in spring. We have not seen that same level reached in summer or these playoffs. And if he's able to dictate, he's able to influence what is going on in that lane, it's going to be an okay time for these Mad Lions because that means he's engaged. He's going to be in these fights. He's going to be in the game. If he's not, if he's on that back foot, you've absolutely lost yourself that opportunity, I think. Because if he's on playing off the back foot, playing off that what is my opponent doing type of thing, absolutely it's going to be all about G2. I think this is if G2 is going to drop a series... It's always this one where they still have an extra life because yeah, you've heard Broken Blade talk about it on, uh, I think it was Euphoria before saying, yeah, we can get pretty cocky sometimes. And if they're the defending champs that from a few weeks ago, they were kind of bodying everybody, I can absolutely see them getting a little bit overconfident and Mad Lions maybe strike to send G2 to losers. Previous years, I'd be Mr. Cool. I'd be Mr. Relax. I'd say whatever happens, I still got my faith in G2. I'm tightening the screws this year. It's got to be a little bit sharper. It's got to be better when you're G2, what you can offer, and especially because I'd like to see you representing as that number one seed, that strong pillar for the LEC. Show me you got it, G2. Tighten it up and lay it down on the Mad Lions. New format, finally getting new format at Worlds. So first seed, who knows what, how heavy the implications are actually going to be. And finally playing on a big stage in Montpellier. I think G2 is going to be business as usual this weekend and book themselves that ticket into the finals. It feels like it's been a while since we had a new champion actually have impact on the pro scene. They've, they've been terrorizing solo queue a little bit, but latest one, we got another vampire on the rift. We are talking Briar and the laziest title I've ever seen Riot do the vampire they didn't even try anything <laughs> I, I guess this is why vlad is a hemomancer they were just saving the vampire tag for old said, Friar. Oh, man we got on. a new one uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah we got another champion rolling through and yes the, these champions have kind of uh it's been tough because we have seen some come through and absolutely obliterate and offer these 200 years type of memes coming in and then sometimes we've seen these champions come through and feel like they're going to be 200 years and then they end up only being about a 200 years champion in your solo queue games not quite translating at that professional level and so when you're looking at someone like briar what we're seeing in her kit i see potential that she could be one of these ones that could creep in i want to see more so about what the player what pro reaction is going to be to her but right now, looking at her kit, there's absolutely some things that stand out. Number one, whose idea was it to just smash Vex's ultimate ability with Kai'Sa and say that's going to be pretty much her ultimate. Not exactly satisfied with that one. And the second one is going to be, of course, looking at her abilities that send her into this frenzy where she's just going off and doing whatever. And it isn't the player's control at that point, but, but what is the skill expression where you're going to be canceling out of these type of abilities and see what you can do at that point. That's something that I am very excited to see, although I realize that can be a little bit of a slippery slope if we start to see things go out of control with Briar. And I mean, with the ulti popped, she's in that frenzy state until the target dies. So if you're popping Zhonya's, going invisible, just being kept up by your team, you could be sitting there for 20 seconds, an entire team fight in this frenzied state if you don't cancel it. That's obviously one of the unique angles on this new kit. And then, of course, having zero base health regen, I feel like will actually be a huge liability in the laning phase and push her even more to being a jungler. It's going to push. I think that is absolutely part of what we'll see as that reaction. And I think as well, it's going to increase this risk reward that is available on this champion because 
you can absolutely pop off and snowball this into something that has even greater, I think, damage potential than some of these other ones. But you are giving, of course, excuse me, that sacrifice over as looking through the... I, I'm interested, at the very least, with Briar and what we're going to be going through. Cautiously optimistic that she's going to have a place and and be something interesting, at the very least, into this new ro- the roster that's expanding for League of Legends. I think the skill expression being so high is directly a path to being used in pro play to be able to kind of master a champion. Combine that with, I mean, technically her ult is a dash. She's got a point and click stun as a melee assassin type champion that can also dash to allies. Her W also can dash over terrain and she has the stun on her Q and the scream, which is a huge stun against the wall. I know they say that's hard to land, but two big forms of CC, two dashes and this frenzy. I mean, this this sounds like it could be a menace in pro play. It could be, and it's it's one of these ones where I want to see it, of course, but at the same time, I'm reminded, as you talked about, we've so many times kind of getting all this information, all this theory crafting and worrying that a champion is going to come through, be busted, be this 200 years, be this dominant presence that we are feeling and going through and sorting through the rest of the year. I think a lot of it is reminding ourselves that at the end of the day, a couple of these ones haven't ended up that type of way. And what actually has ended up being more so these type of options that we don't like or these flavors that come through and disrupt it are the reworks to champions is kind of usually the more offending, uh, you know, identity here is these are the ones that come through and be these aggressive changes compared to these new champions, which take a little bit of time to fill themselves out. Zary excluded. The real question is, and combo we got to see is, does Milio's ulti work on her frenzy? You know, that's the combo. <laughs> so self-saving herself from going insane, you know, that's what we there, need. There's got to be some unique combos to pair around with something like this, something so special, so different than what we've had in the game so far. Very thrilled to see what we're going to be getting from the other content creators and what they can make up. Can't wait to see the vampire on the rift but that's it today for league unlock eric and mark here with you beauty thanks for watching we'll-